The word baptism, it literally means to dip. Nobody really wanted to call this great rite of the church dipping. And besides, to the politicians of the day, it sounded like fully immersing someone in water. So the Greek word baptizo was taken straight into the Latin and then straight into the English. You see, there's something about baptism that always gets the theological and political arguments going. In our patch of Anglicana, for example, one can, within limits, create a communion liturgy quite distinct from those in the New Zealand prayer book, as we have done. You can also, within limits, help couples create their own marriage liturgies that are often quite distinct from anything in the New Zealand prayer book. With funerals, there are very few limits. We specialize in accommodating the dead. Yet with baptism, we're meant to follow the dictates of the New Zealand prayer book to the letter. Interestingly, very few parishes or priests do. Disobedience is rife. A number of church leaders see baptism as entry to the club, the church club. That's why some priests and parishes want parents to be well informed and committed to the doctrine and discipline of the church, including regular attendance before they will baptize children. This is why some priests and parishes are skeptical about children being baptized at all. How can children possibly be committed? And can parents, godparents, really be surrogates when it comes to commitment? In broad terms, there are two understandings of church here that are at odds. One understanding you could call gathered and the other understanding comprehensive. The gathered understanding sees church as those who attend, are on the parish roll and participate. Like a club, you know who is part of it and who isn't. The latter comprehensive understanding sees church as those attendees and non-attendees who try, even occasionally, to live the way of love, justice, and compassion known in Jesus. I don't think you have to be clairvoyant to know where I am in my understanding of church. For those of us then of a comprehensive bent, baptism is not so much about entry into an organization called the church, but about celebrating our entry into this whole wide sacred world. The world's not an evil place from which children and others must escape. Rather, the world, like the church, is infused with godness. At baptism, we celebrate our immersion into the life and mystery of the sacred that is all around us. Baptism isn't about erecting boundaries, it's about God rejecting boundaries. It's about God's yes to each and every one of us, even to a little child. God's yes is the energy, mystery, and source of all life, tenderly and lovingly embracing us, not because we're special, but because everyone is special. So baptism, therefore, is not about proclaiming our commitment so much as God proclaiming God's commitment. It's not proclaiming that we love God, but that God loves us. In baptism, the child does not so much acquire some new identity or magical blessing from on high. Rather, the community simply acknowledges who that child always has been and might potentially become in the embrace of the God called love. One of the ongoing tasks of the church 
is wrestling with language. Language can't contain God. God's bigger than words. Words also change in meaning. Some words important in the past are no longer real for people in their daily life and work. Words like saviour, lord, sin. Some old words are important enough to reinterpret, but most aren't. In a baptism liturgy, cramming a sentence full of outdated church words might satisfy some theological purist, but it's nonsense to the many people who require to say it. One of our tasks, therefore, is finding words that do make sense, that do have meaning and connect with people's lives. In the New Zealand prayer book, Liturgy of Baptism, after hearing quoted a passage from the Book of Acts about receiving the promise of the Holy Spirit, the parents are asked, how do you respond to this promise? Their response is prescribed. We hear God's call and ask for baptism. Well, the question is problematic. What is the promise of the Holy Spirit? Come on, Pat, you've been in church for years and years and years. What is this promise of the Holy Spirit? We've all been here. What is this promise of the Holy Spirit? And what is it in language that makes sense to our daily life today? Further, the idea of telling parents the words they have to say in response seems to my mind to be quite revealing. There's a subliminal institutional message. We want you to think as we tell you to think. We don't want to hear anything different or original from you. We don't want to hear your beliefs. Rather, we want you to fit into ours. And then there's this notion of call. Do you have to feel called by God, however you understand that phrase, in order to bring a child for baptism? Let me be personal. I don't feel called to go to church, celebrate life, join with others in working for change. I don't feel called to go to parties, host parties, or recover from parties. There are lots of things I do because they are a part of who I am. Bringing my children to be baptized is no great existential decision. It's simply a part of who I am. The second question, same as the first, a little bit longer and a little bit worse. Do you renounce all evil influences and powers that rebel against God? Church think has this historical hang up with evil. The question sounds innocent enough, but why are we asking questions about evil at baptism? Why not ask them on Ash Wednesday or Good Friday? This question is a legacy from the days when the church considered kids to be born evil and baptism supposedly washed out the evil as God poured in the good. It's nonsense. 